Hello everyone and welcome to this course on modern application development. Ok, so now let us look a little bit deeper into what exactly a client looks like in the context of an overall web application and in particular we need to understand a bit more about what browsers are capable of doing and you know how they are used in general. So, the minimal requirement from a browser client is that it should be able to render or display the HTML in some way. Okay? Now, keep that in mind, right? Uh, when I say that it should be able to display the HTML or render it in some way, it does not necessarily mean that it has to obey all the requirements of the HTML. In other words, you know, typically we are used to seeing h1 tags being bigger than the surrounding text and so on. That is not compulsory, that is not part of what HTML specifies, it just says this is a heading. Okay? So, it has to be render, uh, the client has to be able to render it in some way that the end user will understand what it is that it is trying to show, that is all. There is also some amount of interaction with the browser, especially this thing called cookies, right? which we had mentioned at some point earlier in the context of authentication, but uh, not really discussed in too much other detail. But any browser to be useful right beyond the bare minimum of just browsing different web pages should also be capable of accepting cookies from the server and returning them on demand right primarily to allow this concept of sessions to exist now the interesting thing is there are browsers that operate in completely text mode right they run from a command line right there is no gui to speak of right and what they can do is pretty much just show you the HTML output in a certain way, accept and respond to cookies, allow form interactions to some extent, but that is it, nothing more. Okay? So, one thing which needs to be kept in mind is that it is potentially possible that somebody is browsing your website completely from the command line and only the HTML text that is being returned by the server can be displayed by such a browser. It cannot do too much JavaScript. Okay? It cannot do images. Well except maybe in some very specific uh, cases, very limited amounts of styling, some amount of form interaction is possible, but most of them would not be able to handle JavaScript for example. Okay? Uh, remember the accessibility guidelines we had spoken about in an earlier lecture, that is also something to keep in mind at the front end. right? Generally speaking, I mean pages should not rely on colors or font sizes in order to convey meaning. The W3 right, the World Wide Web Consortium W3C has accessibility guidelines which basically talks about how this is to be handled, yeah this should be W3C actually. Uh, you know uh, all of those we have discussed earlier, all these also need to be kept in mind when you are thinking about developing a front end. Having said that, you may consciously choose to say that you know my target is some other set of browsers and even accessibility guidelines sort of account for this, right? They say that, okay, you can't really assume that everyone's going to use a text mode browser because that cuts down functionality too much. But if you are using other kinds of things, at least make it so that, you know, even browsers that may not be seen by the user will be able to deliver useful content, okay? Now, the one of the things that browsers do is so-called page styling. Right? Nowadays, of course, we are, we just automatically assume that every, all kinds of uh, page styling is done using CSS, cascading style sheets. Uh, once again, CSS is difficult in accessible browsers, but the thing about CSS is that it actually can even help with that. So, even though you can misuse CSS in some ways and, you know, try to use different font colors and font sizes and so on. The fact that you have done a proper separation of the HTML and styling means that as long as you use CSS and HTML properly, you are actually able to give the best combination of freedom to the browser as well as to the user. Okay? And depending on what kind of browser is being used, it may be able to you know, either ignore the CSS or use some hints from the CSS and make it even more accessible to the user than would normally have been possible otherwise. Okay. So, all of these, I mean, you know, even the split between HTML and CSS came about because of this notion of, you know, separation, encapsulation. At some level, you know, all of these things come back to core ideas such as each part of your design should do one thing and do it well, right? So, the CSS just takes care of styling, 
and does a good job of it. HTML just takes care of giving you structured data, right, or semantically informative data, and does a good job of that. Okay, so that's a good principle to keep in mind, generally speaking, when designing any app or a web page. Now, with all of this, you need some kind of interactivity, right? And some form of client-side programmability is needed. And as I had mentioned earlier, JavaScript became pretty much the de facto standard, meaning that even though nobody actually came up with an idea of standardizing JavaScript, it just was there. It was sufficiently good. It was sufficiently popular that nobody has been able to replace it with another language now. Okay. Now, JavaScript has very interesting. The original JavaScript was very limited in scope in terms of what it could do. But nowadays, it can interact with lots of, I mean, pretty much the entire DOM, so all basic HTML elements, and can also be used independently of the underlying HTML in order to create more complex structures that can, you know, were not originally present on the system. Okay. Now, of course, the performance of this JavaScript depends on the browser and also on the choice of the scripting engine. So there are many different interpreters that are available for JavaScript, right? And the most common ones are what is called V8, which is part of the Chrome browser, which I suspect that the majority of you are using. Uh, those of you who are using Firefox are using actually a different fire JavaScript engine, right? But the thing is, both of them are, at this point, mostly API compatible, meaning that they have access to the same set of resources and the same kind of functionality. So what's different? Why even have two engines? Well, developed independently by two different groups of people. You know, one of them is faster at certain things, one is faster at another. V8 is generally considered one of the most performant engines at this point. But, you know, there might be reasons why you would want to choose, let's say, Firefox. Okay. Uh, the Safari browser from Apple uses another variant, which is their own JavaScript engine. The important point over here is all of these differ primarily in the kind of performance or the kind of memory resources or other things that they might use. But the fact that JavaScript has been reasonably well standardized at this point means that the differences between the engines are actually quite less important at this point in time. Right? Most of them can be expected to behave more or less the same on any JavaScript that you throw at them. Now, what happens when you actually use JavaScript or a JavaScript engine? Remember that this JavaScript is now going to run on the client side in the browser, okay? which means that it is using the CPU power of the client. Okay? And this means that it's quite possible that you could have complex computations that are happening as part of the page layout maybe which all are going to load the CPU of the client. Okay. It, many JavaScript engines also allow you to make use of the graphics processing unit, right? They have extensive graphics support, especially when you want to render images or let's say play video directly inside a web page, right? All this in turn means that, you know, you are actually loading the client side CPU, right? And in the worst case, it is even possible to get it to the point where you are blocking useful computation. In fact, there are certain sites that can cause your browser and in fact, your entire system to hang, right, just by running JavaScript code, okay. Increasingly, the browsers try to prevent it from getting to a point where your entire system hangs, right. So most of Chrome, for example, has this ability to compartmentalize each page so that even if one page sort of tries to use too much CPU, it can be isolated from the rest and may be killed off without harming the rest of your system. Right? There's an interesting website in this relation which talks about the energy drain related to any web page. Right? You can just go to this and they basically access whichever URL you give. And based on the number of requests, the size of the requests, where it's coming from and so on, they do some kind of calculation and tell you that you know this is the approximate amount of impact that you have on the you know carbon dioxide emissions worldwide okay now it's more of a sort of toy example than anything else but it's kind of interesting i mean you know they are trying to refine their computation so that they are reasonably at least keeping up with most of the main important things now apart so far we have been talking about javascript and you know the various forms of clients that we have but one important thing to keep in mind is that a client may not always be a human being Okay, so 
when I say the end user rather need not always be a human being, right? Because the client is actually speaking the program that's making the requests, right? And is obviously not a human, but you know, usually the client is making the requests on behalf of a human being. But there are machine endpoints, right? Especially for things like embedded devices. Let's say that you have got temperature sensors being spread out all around the city and they all need to sort of, you know, pick up the local temperature and post the information onto a central database. One of the simplest ways to do this is to actually define an API on the central database, right? And each of these things basically just runs a small web client which connects to this server and posts the information. Why? Because this actually turns out to be easier to construct than having your own network protocol, right? Because when you construct your own network protocol and the clients need to connect on a given port and, you know, send in a certain way, it means that you are losing out on a lot of uh, things that are naturally available at the server end, right? Which would be possible if you used a web framework. So for example, if I tried building the server as a web application, it means that, you know, interacting with a database, uh, having something else which can then read out the information, providing an API for others to use it, all of that becomes very easy. And as far as the end clients, you know, the temperature sensors are concerned, it's no different, right? Whether you have to connect to a socket and send structured information or, you know, you just do a web request, it's pretty much the same amount of code as far as the endpoint is concerned. But the important thing to keep in mind is there can be cases where your end client is not a human being, right? The end user is not a human being, it's a machine, right? And of course, in such cases, you know, they can't handle things like JavaScript. Typically, of course, they would be handling only specific endpoints, right? An API or something like that. But still, you know, it's something to keep in mind while designing the system. Now, one other interesting thing that can come up is, you know, so far we have been talking about uh, JavaScript as being sort of, as I said, the de facto standard on the web. There are other things. In particular, you know, there is this one thing called Brighton, which if you go to this web page, right, brighton.info, you will see that it essentially talks about a Python 3 implementation for client-side web programming, right? And you can see on the right hand side over here, there is this clock, right? And you look at it, it looks no different from a typical JavaScript clock. The interesting thing is when you go and view the page source, right? Right click on it and view page source. And as you go down over here, you will see that, you know, there is a script type equal to Python, okay? And all of this is Python code, right? It defines a needle. It basically says set clock, it erases the clock to start with, it basically shows the hours, it creates a canvas and finally it basically says, you know, show the entire thing out here and if none of this was possible, in other words, the canvas was not present, in other words, your browser does not support this, it will finally say canvas is not supported and give you an error message. All Python code, right, put into the browser. Now, what's the catch, right? Even though this looks very nice and basically gives the impression that you now have Python code running inside the browser, in practice, what is actually happening is there is a JavaScript engine, right, which is taking that Python and interpreting it. It's doing it sufficiently fast that it sort of gives the impression of actual Python code running in the browser. But the bottom line is that it's still JavaScript, which is running at the inside the engine, okay? So JavaScript is already included with browsers. So then anybody who wants to propose an alternative to that has to give a very good reason, right? So what is usually done is this approach called transpilation, a translation plus compilation step, uh, which is done, uh, you know, I mean, so you can actually write code in many different languages and get it converted into JavaScript, right? Some older browsers tried to directly include custom languages, but now most of the time, you know, the more popular approach is to convert into JavaScript and run it. Having said that, nowadays there is increasingly another sort of front-end language which is called WebAssembly, right? It's not so much a language as a binary instruction format which basically claims to be a so-called executable format for the web. It literally allows you to create binary executables that can run inside a web browser, okay? And it sort of uses the idea of a virtual machine similar to what Java does, 
and potentially can handle fairly high performance execution including access to graphics cards and so on okay it's still not very popular part of the reason is that you know i mean it becomes too specialized i mean you are actually creating a compiled executable which is going to run on a browser and it, you know most of the time at least the basic interactivity that people are used to can be done with something much simpler than that okay so is it really necessary where could it help especially in things like you know online office suites right microsoft office on the desktop is actually usually more well quicker to respond than on the web right if it's compiled into wasm right will that actually help will it become faster potentially yes right you could actually have like full blown applications you could even have things like you know 3d editing and so on happening inside a browser when it's powered by something like this so all this is sort of you know front end moving into the future i mean it's not really all that popular right now at least there is a framework called mscripten which actually can compile code so you can write c or c++ code or actually many other languages as well and convert them directly into web assembly once again it's sort of seen limited usage so far but has a lot of potential in terms of what it can do to the whole front end development moving forward so all of this right at the end of the day is mostly information that is useful for you it's not like we are expecting you to use this at least as part of this course but i think as app developers you need to know what are the possibilities and what are the likely things you are going to see moving forward one last thing in the context of you know the browsers that we interact with there is also this notion of native mode right and what we mean by native mode is i would like the web application to behave like a regular application right and what's the main difference a regular application that's running on my laptop let's say allows me to access and create files right it allows me to save documents right if it's on a phone it will allow me to sort of send and receive messages uh, make phone calls right uh, use the camera apis or the web payment apis right in order to interact with various other things okay now the reason why most of the time javascript does not have direct access to these things is because of security which we will get to later right uh we don't want too much uh sort of functionality being exposed directly to the browser but it can be done through apis and if you can sort of you know as a user can somehow confirm that yes this app is going to be used in a specific way after installing it locally and so on there are many cases where it sort of opens up the ability to use many of these apis okay and in that way it's actually possible to create an app which directly will which is run using uh, web technologies but runs almost like a native client on your machine right now sort of an example of that is something like the visual studio code editor vs code right vs code is basically a web app right it's a chromium browser which is running on your uh, uh, machine and the entire thing including you know the rendering of the pages the syntax highlighting all of that is ultimately html plus css right which is why you can also sort of customize it all the themes are ultimately about writing some form of css and javascript so there are things that can be done in native mode which enhance the functionality of the front end even further 